them both being false, it's not a problem, right? It's not a problem. So, okay, that's all I'm going to stick with there. Just commit that to memory, right? What's really important, aside from that, is the fact that you know that this is a contrary relationship, right? Contraries run at the upper horizontal, contradictories run diagonal, and the next one should be subcontraries, right? So the next, so we've done contraries, and I want to make sure that this is, this remains, uh, this remains user friendly, right? That's the whole point. Um, subcontraries, T R A R I E S, subcontraries run at the bottom half, right? So let me actually write this up here so you can see it, right? Contraries go here, C O N T R A R I E S, and then subcontraries go here, S U B C O N T R A I E S, right? So contradictions diagonally, contraries top horizontal, subcontraries indicated by sub beneath, which is simple, right? Sub beneath. Um, run this direction, right, horizontally. So we're going to be looking at two and four. Okay? Subcountries are a little bit different. It's really just the opposite, obviously, of contraries, logically speaking. Remember, in, in, in um, contraries, as we just said, both of the statements can be false, but both cannot be true. It's just the opposite for subcontraries, right? For subcontraries, both of the statements can be true, but, as we'll see, both of the statements can't be false. So what I have in six is two and four can both be true, but two and four cannot both be false, right? So let's look at it. If I say something is B, remember two and four, they both can be true, but not false. So let's look at both of them being true first. If something is B is true, and I say that something is not B is true, right? If I say something is B is true, two and four can both be true, but not false. Something is B is true. Something is not B is true. Okay? Something is B, something is not B. That sounds a little, how is that? That seems like it might be a contradiction. It really isn't, right? Think of, uh, I think the example that they gave in the link had to do with uh, um, democratic states. It was something along the lines of some, um, how did this example go? Some states, some states are democratic, some states are not democratic. Right? With respect to some states being democratic, some states being not democratic, both of those statements can be true. There isn't a problem with that, right? It, because we know that it's true, right? There are some states that are democratic, United States of America, we have some states that are not democratic, that there's no sort of contradiction relationship to that. I think that example helps, right? So the truth of both um, uh, subcontraries is not a problem. It's only when both are false that we have a problem, right? Two and four can both be true, but they cannot be false. This is part is a little bit more technical. Don't kill yourself about it because you'll see where we'll be able to go with this later. Um, if they're both false, if I say that something is B is false, right? If I say that something is B is false, and I say something is not B is false, right? If I say something is B is false, it's not true that there is anything that's B at all. That's false. And I also say that, well, well, so that this makes sense. If I say that something is B is false, then I immediately think, okay, well, if something is B is false, then that means that, well, something is not B. But then I say that something is not B is also false, and hence the problem, right? So you can't have, for your subcontraries, uh, two falses, right? You can have both, it's just the opposite of your contraries, both can be true, but both cannot be false. Okay, so that, that should be that should be relatively easy, right? Not a problem. All right, so we've done con uh, contradictories diagonally, we've done contraries um, top horizontal, and now we just completed subcontraries bottom horizontal. What's really important more than the truth and falsity, you, you'll have to just sort of memorize it. It really just becomes just brute memorization um, for you to remember this. Anytime I'm talking about contradictories, one or the other has to be true or false. Both can't be true, both can't be false for contradictories. With respect to top level, contraries. Contraries, both can be, um, both can be false, but both cannot be true. Subcontraries, 
just the opposite. Both can be true, both cannot be false. Um, and then I want to go to subalternation. Subalternation is a little bit different, so let me just explain this. This line, top down, really, um, and the image that I use in the other text, I'm going to complicate it a little bit. This is known as sub A L T E R N A T I O N. I can't write it this way. Alright, subalternation goes that way. The arrows for subalternation point directly down, at least at this level. I'm not going to, you know, go any further. There, there might be some exemptions to this, but I don't want to entertain that um, in this analysis. Subalternation. Um, if we talk about the relationship between 1 and 2, right, if we talk, this is just sort of background. If we talk about the relationship between 1 and 2, remember we've divided the board in half. The stuff on the top, 1 and 3, in relation to what's beneath them, 2 and 4, the stuff on the top is called the super altern. I think I put this in here, right? Uh, actually, I didn't put it in here in the notes. I should have put it in here at this point. But it's known as, the top half is known as the super, S-U-P-E-R-A-L-T-E-R-N, one word. Right, the super altern. Right, so the super altern is one is in a super altern relationship to two is how you would say it. Right, three is in a super altern relationship to four. Is, that's how you would word it. Right, um, at the bottom, this is sub a l t e r n subaltern. Right, two is in a subaltern relationship to one. 4 is in a subaltern relationship to 3, but 3 is in a superaltern relationship to 4, and that's how that works, right? So, subaltern, top half, going down, uh, superaltern, top half, going down, subaltern, bottom half, going up. Contradictories going diagonal, contraries, top half, horizontal, subcontraries, bottom half, horizontal. Just committed to memory, right? Just committed to memory. Okay. Um, next, let's look at the relationship, right? So, in uh, subalternation number seven, if one is true, if one is true, then we recognize two must be true, right? If everything is B is true, then something is B is obviously true. If I'm saying everything is B is true, then something is B is obviously true. There's a there's a technical term for that. It's known as instantiation. I'm instantiating from a general claim, right? Later in the series, I'll be talking about the process of deduction and induction. And you can I don't want to get too technical and jump ahead, but technically speaking, you can talk about sort of the preconceptions of the deductive or inductive method from this example, right? Um, the idea, this might, this might be a little too advanced for some people, so this next statement won't be for everybody. But for those of you who do understand, this is for you. The idea, this is just sort of conceptually, the idea of deduction inheres within uh, a subaltern relationship between these two states. Uh, a superaltern, sorry. The idea of deduction inheres within a superaltern relationship between these two states. So if that makes sense, great. If not, I apologize, but I just had to throw that out there. Okay, so obviously one and two uh, can both be true, it's not a problem. But the truth of two, the truth of this does not imply the truth of this, right? That's why the arrow doesn't go back up. I can say everything is B, and then I can say that something is B. But because something is B, doesn't mean that everything is B. And the example, obviously I'm not going to describe this, that's obvious. I'll describe the logical fallacy in this account. Um, I don't know how deep I should take it. And I know my viewers, my viewers do want me to take it deep. Um, so I'll, I'll take it deep just for a second. I, and I didn't want to do this because I want to meet, keep this user friendly. I think this makes sense now and I'll rehash this again just so that it makes sense for sure. But for those of you who have watched my series on predicate logic um, and you guys already know formalization and predicate logic, well, you recognize the following claim. 
This error, the error to try and go from the bottom back up, is an error of attempting to, you cannot, right, you can never, I don't have this in the notes, but you can see it in there. You cannot uh, You cannot generalize everything. Everything is a generalized term. Something is an existential term, right? This is a universal term represented by this. This is an existential term represented by this. You can go from a general term to a specific, but you cannot go from a specific to a general, right? So you cannot universally generalize from an existential A-T-I-O-N, right? You cannot, I-S-T-A-N-T, uh, I spelled that wrong, but it doesn't matter. Okay, you can, you, you can go from a universal claim to a specific claim, but you cannot go from a specific claim to a universal claim, right? You can't do that, right? Um, it doesn't follow necessarily. It doesn't follow, follow with necessarily. It could be the case, but it doesn't have to be the case, right? So, um, hence that point, just uh, a, technical, a technical point. Um, similarly, the same is, is the same, right? Um, from uh, the truth of one, from the truth of two, you cannot, and I put this actually in the notes, I didn't think I put it in the notes, you cannot universally generalize from an existential instantiation. The last point has to do with number eight, and this is the relationship between the super alternate relationship between three and four, right? If it's the case that I say, if three is true, that nothing is B, then four must be true, right? Something is not B. If I say nothing is B, nothing is B, right? Nothing is B, then it has to be the case that something is not B, right? If I say nothing is B, nothing is B, this, this is open game, I guess, if you want to, I want to keep it ghetto so that it's intelligible. If I say nothing is B, then this is open game, this is fair game. And then I say, yeah, there's actually something there. Well, fine, no problem. Uh, I think that's clear. I hope it's clear. Um, if three is true, if three is true, nothing is B, then four must be true. Something is B, obvious. But the truth of four does not imply the truth of three. If I say something is not B, it doesn't necessitate that nothing at all is B. It doesn't necessitate that nothing at all is B, right? because we don't know what other... Um, variables we have that are accessible, right? Furthermore, you cannot assert the truth of three, nothing is B, from the idea that something is not B. Okay, so that, that background information concludes this initial sort of approach, and what we're going to do now is I'm going to try and apply that to uh, a more conceptually rigorous uh, account. Hopefully uh, that makes that makes sense.